Today, we are going to look at SAT practice test one and do a math walkthrough on the no calculator section. We are also going to show you tons of SAT math tips, tricks, and hacks. So remember to like or subscribe and let's dive in. K, question one. If x minus one over three equals k and k equals three, what is the value of x? It's actually pretty straightforward. Question is, we're being asked to find x. All we're going to do is shove in three for k and solve for x. So shove in the three for the k, multiply each side of the equation by three. That's the fastest way to do it. The three is on the left cancel. We're left with x minus one equals nine and x equals 10. Answer choice D. Question number two, honestly, all they're trying to do is freak you out. For i equals the square root of negative one, boy, does that look ugly. What is the sum of seven plus three i plus negative eight plus nine i? And all you have to do is combine the terms and it's easy, I'm gonna show you how. So they're asking you what all that mess equals. We are just gonna combine the like terms, which means we combine the seven and the negative eight, which is negative one. And we combine the three i and the nine i, which is 12 i. And so it's just negative one plus 12 i when we put it together. A is the correct answer. Honestly, that's all there is to it. The SAT loves model questions. Now, a model question is just a math equation that describes something in real life. In this case, the total number of messages Armand sent plus the total number of messages Tyrone sent. On model questions, the first thing you do is always ignore all the words and write down the variables and what they mean. Then, we we'll use those variables to describe how many total messages Armand and Tyrone sent, and then we'll add them together. So M is how many messages Armand sent each hour, and P is how many messages Tyrone sent each hour. So the total number of messages that Armand sent is M times five, because they tell us Armand texted for five hours. The total number of messages that Tyrone sent is P times four because they tell us he texted for four hours. Add them together and you get 5M plus 4P or answer choice C. So this is another model question. I told you the SAT loves model questions. Again, a model question is just a math equation that describes something in real life. In this case, how many phones Kathy repairs? Now we're being asked about this 108 number, what it represents. Now this is important. In model questions, the number bolted onto the equation with a plus or minus sign is usually the constant. And the constant is usually the starting point. Now we can tell that 108 is a constant because it's the number that's bolted onto the equation with a minus sign. So 108 must be the starting point. That must represent how many phones Kathy starts with. So we just look for an answer choice that says something about this is how many phones she starts with. And that's exactly what answer choice B says. And it's the right answer. Question number five is another one where they want you to combine a whole bunch of ugly looking stuff, but there is a twist and they're gonna do something here that they like to do a lot. So first of all, you're just being asked to combine all that stuff. The deal is, and the twist is, you have to distribute the minus sign first. And we're gonna talk about that and you're gonna see this a lot. They really like that trick. And after we do that, then we just combine all the like elements. So the first thing we do is we distribute that minus sign through the parentheses on the right. And all that does is it just flips the sign of every single term on the parentheses. Now we can just combine the stuff and let's see the negative three Y squares and the positive three Y squares, they're gonna cross off. We combine everything else and we get two X squared plus two X Y squared. That is answer choice. C, nice job. Yet another model question. Again, model questions are just math equations that describe something that happens in real life. In this case, how much a boy grows each year. So we're being asked what happens to the boy's height when age goes up by one year. Now in model questions, we always ignore all the words and just write down the variables and what they mean. And in this case, H is height, and A is age. The next step is always rephrase the question into something like, what happens to X when Y does this? In this case, the question is asking, 
what happens to H when A goes up by one? Getting the question into that form is absolute key because now it's a lot easier to see what we need to do. We'll just test it and see what happens. We'll just increase A by one and see what happens to H. So let's start out by setting A equal to two and see what H becomes. Do a little bit of math and H equals six plus 28.6. Great. Let's increase a by one and make a equal to three. Now let's see what happens to h and h equals nine plus 28.6. So h increased by three when a increased by one. That is answer choice A. Like I said, this one is all about trying to intimidate you, and in reality, this is super easy. What they're really getting at is, do you know what happens to a fraction when it moves from one side of an equation to the other? It just flips on its head, like this. X equals 2 thirds Y becomes 3 halves X equals Y. The 2 thirds just flips and becomes 3 halves, and it doesn't matter how complicated or stupid the fraction is, it always just flips on its head. And the very same thing is going to happen to this fraction, too. There's no way I'm writing it all out. But answer choice B flips the equation on its head. Easy peasy. Question 8. If A over B equals 2, what is the value of 4B over A? Here's the thing. Whenever they give you two equations or two expressions in the question stem, they want you to find a way to combine those two things. I'm going to show you how to do it. So the question is, they just we just need the value of 4B over A. What they're really testing you on this question is to see if you know that a fraction is just a ratio. In other words, A over B equals 2. Well, that's the very same thing as A over B equals 2 over 1. So we can just pretend that A equals 2 and B equals 1 and just shove those values into the equation we're asked to solve. So we put in 1 for B, we put in 2 for A, and we solve it, which is 4 over 2, which is 2. That's it. Answer choice C. Question 9 gives you two equations, and then underneath it says, what is the solution x, y to the systems of equations above? And that is just a fancy way of saying we need an x and a y that work in both equations. That's all. Now, there's an easy way to do this. The fastest way is to add or subtract the equations to get a variable to drop out, then solve. You can substitute as well, but adding and subtracting the equations, a little faster. So usually what we have to do is we have to multiply up one of the equations like this. So equation one is just 3x plus 4y equals negative 23. Equation two is negative x plus 2y equals negative 19. I just switched that equation so that the x's and y's will just kind of line up. So what we do for equation two, let's just multiply that up by two. So now we have negative 2x plus 4y equals negative 38. Why did we do that? Haha, <laughs> because of this. Now, when we subtract these equations, we have 3x minus a negative 2x. That leaves 5x. But look at this. 4y minus 4y, that equals no more y's. And negative 23 minus a negative 38 is like negative 23 plus 38, which is 15. Just like that, x is 3. We can actually stop at this point because there's only one answer choice that has x equals 3. And that's answer choice B. But if you wanted to plug in and just make sure, you can plug uh, X back into either one of those equations, and you're going to find that you're going to get negative 8 for Y. OK, good job. This one is all about trying to confuse you with this G of X stuff. It's not hard. You just need to put it into terms that make sense. What you're actually being asked is, what is the value of AX squared plus 24 when X equals negative 4? couple of things to keep in mind with these types of questions. First, remember that whatever they put into the parentheses next to the G, well, that's the value of X. In this case, the value of X is equal to negative 4. Also, the phrase G of 4 equals 8 means that the entire equation AX squared plus 24 will equal 8 when X equals 4. And that's really good for us because that means we can plug 4 in for x and solve for a. So let's do that. So a little bit of math, substitute in the 4 for the x, and we end up with 
a equals negative 1. Perfect. Now that we know the value of a, we can figure out what we were originally asked for, which is, what is the value of ax squared plus 24 when x is negative 4? We just substitute in negative 1 for a and negative 4 for x and solve. And when we do that, plug in, make the substitutions, and we figure out that it equals 8. That's answer choice A. The tricky part of question 11 is getting it out of their confusing English and into a simple math equation that you can actually solve. You're being asked, what is the price per pound of beef when it equals the price per pound of chicken? Or in math, what is B when 2.35 plus 0.25x equals 1.75 plus 0.4x? So all of those confusing words really mean they just want you to set the equations equal to each other and solve. So let's do that. Let's see, a little bit of algebra, a little bit more algebra, and we're going to find that x equals 4. Whoop, great, fantastic. But we're not being asked to find x. We're being asked to find b. That's why it's important to always write down what you're being asked for. I promise you writing that down is a game changer on harder questions. It's going to make your life so much easier. Truth is, it's pretty easy to find b. We're just going to plug in 4 for x and solve. And when we do that, a little math, well, we find that the answer is 3.35 or D. Number 12, a line in the XY plane passes through the origin, that's 0, 0.00, and has a slope of 1 over 7. Which of the following points lies on the line? So you're being asked is which point does the line intersect what they're really asking here is do you know that slope is just rise over run so a slope of one over seven just means we count up one and then we go over seven or we could go down one and over seven the best way to do these just draw a graph so we start at point zero zero because we're told that the line goes through that and then let's see we go up one and over seven that puts us at 0.71, and that is absolutely not an answer choice. Okay, what happens if we go over one more? That's going to be up one and over another seven. That puts us at 0.142. Hey, that is an answer choice. That is answer choice D. Remember, slope is just rise over run. Oftentimes, drawing this stuff out is the fastest way to get to the right answer. Good job. Question 13 all comes down to simplifying a tricky fraction, and I'm about to teach you a really fast and easy way to do that. When you're adding tricky fractions, always multiply the denominators together to create a common denominator. Then multiply that common denominator through the entire fraction, and it's so much easier to actually do than it is to explain, so let's just do it. Let's take a look at that ugly denominator, and you'll see what I mean. So the common denominator is x plus 2 times x plus 3. And don't bother combining all that stuff. Just multiply that denominator through the entire equation. And our job is to find the value of that question mark. Now here's where it gets good and your life gets easier. We just cross off. x plus 2 crosses off the first fraction and x plus 3 crosses off the second fraction and we're left with x plus 3 plus x plus 2 equals question mark. That's what we're solving for. x plus 2 times x plus 3. Because we're solving for the question mark, we want to get it all alone on the right side of the equation. So we divide everything by x plus 2 times x plus 3. And let's see, we'll just combine the stuff in the numerator. And just like that, we have found what the denominator equals. Go us! But remember, the denominator they put that under 1, and that's fine. Whenever they put a fraction in the denominator and the numerator is 1, and they love to do that, that just means we get rid of the numerator and flip the denominator on its head, like this. And now we're actually done, because there's only one answer choice that has 2x plus 5 in the denominator, and that is answer choice B. Now, this is a great question to do several times. Solving complicated fractions using this method comes up all the time. It's a really important skill, and if you do it this way, you'll always cut through the question really fast and easily. 
Okay, number 14. If 3x minus y equals 12, what is the value of 8 to the x over 2 to the y? So there are a couple classic things going on in this. Number one, whenever they give you two equations in the question stem, just like they did here, two math expressions, they always want you to find a way to combine them. Number two, whenever you are into multiplying or dividing exponents like we are here, always, always, always get the bases the same. That's going to be your first step. The other thing we hate is we hate denominators. Now, when we're in exponents, it's actually super easy to get rid of denominators. All you do is flip the sign on the exponent, and that flips the number from the denominator to the numerator. Okay, so let's see how this one works. First, we get the bases the same, and we're gonna go with this 8x over 2y thing. Well, the bases aren't the same. We got a two base in the denominator, an eight base in the numerator, but we can fix that because eight is the very same thing as two raised to the third. So we're just gonna rewrite eight as two raised to the third. Still have to raise it to x. So that means that the numerator becomes two raised to the three x. Remember, when you raise an exponent to another exponent, you multiply. Okay, we got the bases the same. Very well done. Next step, we hate the denominator. Easy to get rid of the denominator. All we're going to do is flip the sign on that y, and that puts the denominator, that 2y, into the numerator. So now we have 2 to 3x times 2 to the negative y, and now when we multiply things with the same base, all we do is keep the base, so keep the 2, and then we add the exponents. So that becomes 2 to the 3x minus y. Now I see how these equations that they gave us up, up in, the, in the question stem combine, because 3x minus y happens to equal 12. So this is the same thing as 2 to the 12th. Very, very clever question. This is uh, just kind of a classic SAT question. Remember when you're dealing with exponents, get those bases the same. Remember you can flip things from the denominator into the numerator by changing the sign of the exponent. Okay, really nice job. All right, this is a tricky one, but don't worry, we're gonna make it really easy for you. Now, no matter how intimidating they try and make the question, always start by writing down what you've been asked for, always. I promise this is gonna help you a lot. Now, in this case, we're being asked to find the value of C or the value of the number that comes before the X. Whenever they give you two quadratic equations set equal to each other along with the phrase for all values, your job is to put each side of the equation into identical form because each term in each equation has to be identical. And if we get the equations into the same form, it makes it really easy to, easy to compare each term. One more thing, they told us a plus b equals 8 for a reason. We just don't know why yet. Okay, first things first, let's foil out the left side of the equation so it looks like the right side. Okay, all right, we do that, combine all the stuff, and there we go. The left side of the equation is now in the same form as the right side of the equation. Now, we know for sure that the term in front of x squared equals 15, and it has to equal 15 in each equation. Remember, each term in each equation has to be the same. So that means that a times b must equal 15. And we're also told that a plus b equals 8. So if a times b equals 15 and a plus b equals 8, then a must equal 5 and b must equal 3, or vice versa. Now our job is to figure out that middle term, the term in front of the x. So in that middle term, let's plug in 3 for a and 5 for b and solve. So when we do that, plug in a little bit of math, and it looks like we get 31. Hey, guess what? D is the only answer choice that has 31 in it, so D must be correct, and it is. All right, number 16, if t is greater than zero and t squared minus four equals zero, 
what is the value of t? So all we're being asked for is to find what t equals. There's something going on in this question that I always want you to, like it should drop a little red flag in your head. Whenever they take a variable and raise it to an even exponent, you should be suspicious. Because remember, if x squared equals nine, then x could equal three or x could equal negative three. Now, in this case, notice that they go out of their way to tell you that t is greater than zero. So let's see, t squared minus four equals zero. So what, all we're gonna do is um, add each, add four to each side, t squared equals four. So that means that t could equal two or negative two, but we're told that t has to be greater than zero. That means t equals two. Nice job. Boy, this one seems confusing at first, but remember, it doesn't matter how confusing or intimidating they try and make the question. We always start in the same spot. We just write down what we're being asked to find. And in this case, they're asking us to find the value of X. We need to know how long that line is. Here's a pro tip. Whenever the test gives you two triangles and a ton of measurements, you're probably in a similar triangle question. And if you have two angles that are the same, you have similar triangles and that is great news for us because similar triangles all have legs that are in the same proportion. Now, if that seems a little confusing right now, hold on for about 20 seconds and this is all gonna become very clear. First, let's just draw out what we're given. Now, we're told that angle D is the same as angle E and we know that these two angles are the same because they're across from each other. If we have two angles that are the same, then we have similar triangles. The big triangle ABC is similar to the small triangle CBD. Now, if we line up the angles, that means that side DB lines up with side BE. Side DB is 700 and side EV is 1400. So every side of the big triangle is twice as big as every side of the small triangle. So that means side X must be twice as long as side DC. So side X must be 1600. Okay, this is another systems of equation question. This is very, very similar to number nine. So it gives us two equations and then it says, according to the system of equations above, what is the value of X? What you're really being asked for is you need an X value that works in each equation. The fastest way to do these is to add or subtract the equations to get the Y to drop out. And that usually means that you need to multiply one of the equations up by something to get the variable to drop out. Harder to talk about than it is to do in practice. It's actually pretty intuitive. Here's how it works. So equation one is X plus Y equals negative nine. Equation two is X plus two Y equals negative 25. So we're gonna multiply that first equation up by two. So we get two X plus two Y equals negative 18. Why did we do that? Well, because when we subtract these equations, what we get is two X minus X equals X. 2y minus 2y, hey, that's no more y's. We got the y's to drop out, go us. And negative 18 minus a negative 25, that's the same thing as negative 18, plus 25, that equals seven. Excellent job. If you found this a little confusing, remember, go back to look at question number nine, works the same way. Good job. Question 19 is a big, scary trig question, except Trig really isn't so big and scary on the SAT, and I'll show you why in a second. But first, we always write down what we've been asked for. In this case, we need the cosine of the angle 90 minus X. Trig on the SAT usually comes down to knowing these three ratios. Ratio one, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Ratio two, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And ratio three, tangent is opposite over adjacent. Now, trig is all about right triangles, so let's draw one and fill in what we know. So we know the sine is four over five. So we know for sure that the hypotenuse is five and the side opposite angle X, and we can put angle X on either of the two angles. It doesn't matter. We'll put it there. That must be four. Okay, so that means we actually have ourselves a special three, four, five right triangle. We know for sure the other side is three. Now, we also know that the other angle, the one we haven't drawn in, must be 90 minus X because a triangle has 180 degrees. So we should be able to add up all the angles and should come out to 180 degrees. 
90, that's that right angle, plus x plus 90 minus x does indeed equal 180. So we're being asked for the cosine of that angle, the 90 minus x angle. So that's adjacent over hypotenuse, which is, as it turns out, the adjacent is 4, the hypotenuse is 5, it's 4 over 5. Okay, question 20. If a equals 5 times root 2 and 2a equals the square root of 2x, what is the value of x? Okay, it looks complicated, but I don't think it's going to be all that hard. I'll show you. So first, we always write down what we're being asked. We need to find x. Second, whenever the SAT gives you two equations in the question stem like they did here, it's going to want you to combine them. And finally, whenever we're multiplying stuff, we get to break things down and switch around terms and cross stuff off from each side, all this stuff. It's awesome. We love multiplying and that's what we're doing here. We're multiplying stuff so we get to break it down however we want. First thing, let's combine stuff. So we know that a equals 5 root 2 and then 2a equals square root 2x. So guess what we're going to do? 2a just became 2 times 5 square root of 2 equals uh, square root of 2x. Now we get to break some stuff up and it's going to make things a lot easier. So on the left side, it's just 2 times 5 times the square root of 2. And on the right side, we have the square root of 2 times the square root of x. That's why we love multiplication. We get to do that. Now it's pretty easy to see that the square roots of 2, they just cross off on each side because we don't have any plus and minuses. We, we just have multiplication. And we love that. So that means we have 10 equals the square root of x. What we're going to do is square each side. 100 equals x. Nice. Remember, when you're just multiplying stuff, when you don't have any plus or minuses to worry about, you can break stuff up any way you want that's most convenient for you. And usually breaking stuff up is going to help you a lot, especially in this non-calculator portion of the test. Good job. All right, that's it. Very nice job. If you found this video helpful, please make sure to remember to either hit the like button or hit the subscribe button to get more great videos. And also, if you are interested in the full course, we offer the complete ACT and SAT course. It's only 50 bucks because here at First Choice Admissions, we don't think that the size of your wallet should limit the size of your opportunities. And we want to make sure this is affordable for everyone. Okay, guys, see you next time.